Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner and this is Stradi Bianchi. Now this is a fabulous one day race that is growing to the stratosphere in terms of its importance and its legendary status. It is growing fast because top, top names, the best in the world are winning here. Today's women's race was fantastic, so if you get a chance, go back and watch that. I'm covering the men's right now, but it is well worth watching the women's race. They put on a show throughout the course. Now in the men's race, 185 kilometers, 11 sectors of gravel, white gravel, finely, finely packed down, but slippery still and nasty, and it's windy out there. Now, with over 30% of today's 185 kilometers covered in white gravels, you know it's going to be a crazy course like it is every year. And with so much wind, it does not disappoint. When the cameras come on just under 100 kilometers to go, there is a massive crash involving all the big favorites. It's Julian Alaphilippe that first you see with the eyes and his Clipping out of the pedals, he's trying to save the bike. It looks like he's got it saved, and then he can't save it because it's the Alpacine Phoenix rider that's sliding all the way to the left side of the road, loses. The bike goes down right in front of Julian Alaphilippe just as it looks like he might save it and pull it out. Instead, his bike is flying in the air. It's a spectacular crash. Everybody's going down everywhere. And it's Tade Pogac, our two-time Tour de France champion, that goes down in the crash. Now, there's a lot of stuff to dissect because it was absolutely unbelievable how people were falling down. Riders were just crashing all over. Now, the announcers are telling you it's because of the wind. Absolutely. That is the main factor. But there's so many factors in, the, in this crash. It's unbelievable. If you look... There's so much wind coming, but as they're first coming down, there's a bend slightly to the right. Once they start getting into that right bend, now you start getting that full crosswind coming. So when they're first going down the descent, you have a bit more of a cross headwind coming at, so it's not pushing the bike so much. Once that road bends to the left like that and they get the full brunt of that side crosswind, that's what's going to be a big factor. But on top of that, remember, when you get into a big crosswind at these kind of speeds, the wheels, you have to lean them over and you have to lean the whole bike over to keep the bike straight. Otherwise, it's going to start curving to the left. That's why the Alpacine Phoenix rider started sliding and moving all the way to the left until he crashed in front of Julian Alaphilippe. Julian Alaphilippe and the other riders are having problems because the road is actually curved and slanted down at an angle the opposite way of what you would want when the wind's coming right to left. So now, because of the loose gravel, the riders can't get the bike leaned over, otherwise it's going to slip. Now, because of the wind, it's pushing the bikes to the left. And now, because of the Alpacine Phoenix rider basically dropping his bike right in front of the front wheel of Julian Alaphilippe as the two-time world road champion is about to save it now it's spectacular crashes everywhere now behind that the reason all the other riders start crashing is because they see the julian alaphilippe crash with tade pagachar and every all the other big favorites up there and when the riders behind it's because they're grabbing the brakes and once they grab the brakes that's it the tires are going to slip and they start going down and there's 50 70 riders all over the road spread out Tade Pogaccio, I want to point out, because the camera's really focused on Julian Alaphilippe. How can you not when he's two-time road world champion and he's got the striped jersey? But real quick, if you watch Tade Pogaccio, when he crashed, he jumps up immediately, probably loses 5, 10 seconds at the most. He's back on his bike and he's in the front group when it's world champion left behind with just a couple teammates to look after him. Now, Julian Alaphilippe with his Dakuna quick step teammates, he's got two of them on the front. It's Honore and Schmidt that are doing a great job riding for the world champion and trying to get him back up to the front group. Meantime, up front, it's Bahrain victorious in full force up there. And it's hard to tell if they're going 100% at the front and they're just fatigued, so they're not really, really going fast. But it looks like to me they want to try to keep the world, the world champ from getting back. This is a mistake in my mind because in this front group, yes, you lost Julian Alaphilippe, 
but you still have two-time Tour de France champion on form, two-time Tour de France champion, Tadej Pogacar in the front group. So Bahrain victorious, no matter what you do up there, if you're driving and you got Julian Alaphilippe still chasing, you still got to work with Tadej Pogacar up front. And Tadej Pogacar, he's in no hurry. He's staying out of trouble. He's holding on the, onto the wheels, always in the draft spot. But Julian Alaphilippe and his Dakuna Quick Step teammates, they do a great job of getting them back up to the front group with about 75 kilometers to go. And then Julian Alaphilippe wastes no time and he makes sure everybody in the race knows he's back as he rides up to the front of the group. Shortly after that, we see a big, big battle with 65 kilometers to go because the next gravel section's coming up and it's with 52 kilometers to go just as they're catching the last of the breakaway riders Taco Vanderhorn, Lillian, call me Jean, or how I like to say it, call me Jane, but don't call me late. He's in the front group, and he did a fantastic job. But with so much stress, wind, fighting for the gravel sections, the speeds in the peloton you know have been absolutely at maximum throughout today's race. And then with Bahrain victorious on the front, pulling so hard, trying to keep the world champion off, that it's the front group of five is finally caught and wrapped up. Julian Alaphilippe wastes no time now. He goes to the front and throws in an attack with 52 kilometers to go. Throws in another second attack and he opens up a gap on everyone and it's Tade Pogacar that closes the gap and he throws in the next big acceleration in today's famous race. Behind, it's Julian Alaphilippe fell apart. Carlos Rodriguez jumped and he gets almost up to Tadej Pogacar's wheel. He's back there 10, 12, 15 seconds as the gap just keeps stretching out up front. Tadej Pogacar is diving down the descents, taking maximum risk to gain time on all the favorites behind. He is on the pedals with 50 kilometers to go. It is a marvelous show. Now, in my mind, I think right away he should have sat up and waited for Carlos Rodriguez. Carlos Rodriguez riding for Ineos has two teammates in the back group of favorites now, which is getting dramatically reduced if, if, Tade Pogacar waits for Carlos Rodriguez. The two can work together, and Inos back there will sit on and help block is what I'm thinking. When you're watching Carlos Rodriguez, he just cannot bring the gap back on Tade Pogacar. And then finally, after 20, 25 kilometers in the front, he's caught. And all the time now, Tade Pogacar has just extended his time gap with every kilometer passing inch and seconds seconds and seconds gain now he's at one and a half minute lead on all the favorites back there until with 22 kilometers to go it's quick steps Casper Asgreen that throws in a big attack. We'll see Julian Alaphilippe, world champ, coming out the back. He'll wave goodbye to Strade Bianche as Casper Asgreen is throwing in an attack. He's got some company behind because it's the veteran rider Alejandro Valverde. Warming my heart seeing the old veteran right up there from Movistar. Bridging the gap up to Casper Asgreen. He has some company with Enios. Jonathan Navarez made it. Tim Wellens, Lotto Sudal is in there for company. And then they got along the American rider Quinn Simmons from Trek Segafredo. He has got some legs today on the classic roads of Italy. With that group of five chasing, automatically the gap starts to drop to Tade Pagacha with less than 20 kilometers to go. We're talking about a minute lead. He lost about 30 seconds. And now with... Casper Asgreen coming on form. He was suffering a bit last week in Het Volk, came a little bit better in Kern, Brussels, Kern, but today Casper Asgreen's legs are on fire and he is gaining some time on the two-time two -time Tour de France champion Tadej Pogacar. He'll throw in a big attack on the climb with 19 kilometers to go as that opens up a gap and starts bringing the time down on Tadej Pogacar. The veteran rider Alejandro Valverde finds some extra energy and bridges cross up to Casper Asgreen, but the gap to Tade Pogacar is about 55 seconds. Now with eight kilometers to go, a few more seconds pop off, seven kilometers to go. We're at about 47 seconds, and then with six kilometers to go, we see a reverse in time, and that's when we start to know Tade Pogacar looks like he's got today's Strade Bianchi wrapped up. With two kilometers to go, we start seeing Tade Pogacar empty his pockets. He's throwing everything off because he knows with one kilometer 
to go. There is a massively steep climb to the finish of today's race with everything out of the pockets with the bottle off the bike. He's as light as he can possibly make it. He starts the climb with one kilometer to go, punches it hard under the national flag, gives a high five to one of the fans on the side of the road and drills it on the pedals up to the top of the last climb into the Piazza del Campo for a famous victory solo 51 kilometer solo my god it was amazing victory for Tade Pagacha absolutely stellar solo ride today. Behind it's the veteran rider Alejandro Valverde who dropped Casper Asgreen and will solo in for second. Casper Asgreen finishes the podium sweep there and behind it's the FDJ rider Valter who comes in for fourth on today's race. Fabulous result. I just wanted to point his out. He's a young kid. We saw him at the Giro last year start to shine and here he is fourth on today's race. Now behind, I want to point some stuff out about today's race before they start because when you start seeing all the crashes, I know a lot of time the fans leave comments all the time. I can't believe there's so many crashes. I feel so bad. The crashes are part of it. Now yesterday I'm out riding my motocross bike. I'm shooting between the gap of two trees there and I come up short and I just completely dissect the little pinky here and had to go to the urgent care and get seven stitches put in the pinky. I'm here to tell you that is part of the love of the sport. When these riders are dressing up and getting ready in the bus for this famous race, they all know the risk involved. If there was no risk, it wouldn't be fun, folks. I'm sitting there in the urgent care yesterday getting the stitches put in my finger and the doctor there's looking at me and he's, and he's like, why do you do this? And I'm thinking, why don't I do it? It is absolutely fabulous. As long as there's doctors to stitch you up, to fix you and send you back out there to heal correctly and do the next race, I'm always up for taking a risk. If you're gonna have some enjoyment and you're watching a race like this and you're doing exciting things, but without the risk, there is not that same kind of joy and energy while you're racing. So when the riders crash, just salute them. It was a marvelous moment in the race. You know it's coming, it's always going to be here, but that is what all these riders are, that's what's making this race so exciting for all these riders. And myself, every time I did these kind of races, I was scared, scared the whole time. But the whole time I was scared, I was loving every moment of it. Every rider that finishes today's race will remember how spectacular of a day it was, whether if they won or they are the last rider to finish on the result sheets of today's race. So for all you guys who crashed, I salute you. For Tadej Pogacar, I salute you. That was marvelous, even going down in the crash and still winning today's race. I look forward to the next races coming up at Torino Adriatico. Let me remind you guys, Inyo still have not been able to beat the two Slovenians, Tadej Pogacar or Primoz Roglic in the last couple years anywhere with the only result coming from Ghana at the UA Tour last year in the individual time trial. So when you're watching Torino Adriatico, when you're watching Perry Nice starting here tomorrow and on Monday, remember Inos have gotten beaten up from these two Slovenians for the last couple years. They need to come back and win somewhere against these Slovenians to bring that Inos squad back up to the dominance years that we are so used to for the last decade. Otherwise, at this moment, it's UAE Team Emirates. It's Yumbo Visma and of course Quick Step that are the three most dominant teams in the European Peloton at this moment. Enos, I know they won a lot last year, huh? It's crazy when you see me sitting here, but they have yet to be able to beat the Slovenians anywhere. Should be an exciting two more big stage races starting tomorrow. Perry Nice, Trino Adriatico. I will cover Trino Adriatico here on the Butterfly Effect. And I will watch Perry Nice. And if something exciting comes up, I'll cover that on Beyond the Coverage. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys on the next edition of The Butterfly Effect.